Hello from Children's Hospital Colorado. I'm Dr. Elizabeth Cohen, Assistant Professor and Clinical Faculty at the School of Medicine and Chutes Medical Campus. I work as a clinical psychologist in the Department of Developmental Pediatrics at Children's Hospital Colorado. Developmental Pediatrics is a robust assessment, treatment, and research center staffed by an interdisciplinary team of dedicated specialists. This includes 15 developmental behavioral pediatricians, 23 psychologists, as well as social workers, family navigators, nurses, and clinical care coordinators. In addition, we have a well-established and respected training program that supports medical students and clinical trainees across all disciplines. Diagnostic assessment for autism spectrum disorder makes up a substantial part of our clinical service. As a team, we complete an average of 22 new patient diagnostic evaluations per week and are seeing upwards of 1,700 patients per month across our various developmental clinics. However, like so many other institutions across the country, it is proving nearly impossible to stay ahead of the growing need for these assessments. Autism spectrum disorder is the world's fastest growing developmental disability, with the current prevalence rate in the United States being one in 36 children. This reflects a 317% increase in prevalence since the year 2000. As such, there is much work to do, not only to improve access to accurate, efficient assessments, but to support these patients and their families after diagnosis as well. Over the past few years, it has been increasingly stated by specialists within the field of autism that we need to expand and redefine our approach to diagnostic assessment in order to meet the ever-growing needs of this population. Stated plainly, this means that the job of diagnosing autism must move beyond the walls of specialty centers and into the hands of capable, well-trained medical professionals within our greater community. Our department is constantly working on new initiatives to aid in these efforts. We have several projects, including e-consultation services, outreach clinics, and physician education programs designed to support community providers in this work. I'm the director of one of these initiatives called the Pediatric Care Network Autism Program, which is a physician education and training program designed to support primary care providers in the identification and management of autism. This program includes in-person trainings at the primary care office on topics such as review of the diagnostic criteria of autism, talking to families about autism and developmental differences, and conducting an autism-focused developmental history. Participating providers then complete these interviews in the home office when concern for autism arises. In some cases, when autism symptoms are clear, this interview can aid in independent diagnosis by the PCP. In other cases, where autism is likely but further assessment warranted, the information gathered in the primary care office accompanies a referral to developmental pediatrics, which is then expedited to a specific clinic for the evaluation to be completed by the specialty team. When the evaluation is complete, the referring provider receives personalized feedback related to their referral and the information they provided to the assessment team. These open lines of communication allow for ongoing consultation between the specialty clinic and community primary care providers, which in turn leads to refined and improved referrals, as well as growing confidence related to identification of autism by community providers. Since the inception of this program in 2018, we've trained over 150 providers across 23 different practices in the state of Colorado, and we've seen over 300 patients through this referral pathway. Part of this program involves an in-person training where we speak in depth about the medical criteria for diagnosing autism spectrum disorder. Understanding the behavioral symptoms and how they manifest across presentations is a critical piece of accurate autism diagnosis. I'm going to highlight some of the key concepts that are often discussed during this important training. With the significant increase in prevalence of autism over the past two decades, we're often asked what might explain this increase. Is there more autism in the world, or are we just diagnosing it more frequently? The truth is a combination of both. The way we diagnose autism has changed over the past 10 years, starting with a shift in the diagnostic criteria that was published in the fifth edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual back in 2013. With this update, the field reconceptualized the criteria for autism into two main categories. The first is social communication differences, and the second is differences related to restricted interests, or more kindly referred to as spins or special interests by the autistic community, and repetitive behaviors. 
This second category is also where we capture differences related to behavioral rigidity, as well as sensory interests and sensitivities or aversions. We must see evidence of difference in both of these categories when diagnosing autism spectrum disorder. To dive in a bit deeper, social communication challenges have long been regarded the hallmark difference demonstrated by individuals with autism. In this first category, we are looking for examples of social differences in three distinct ways. Please note that as I describe the diagnostic criteria, I will use words such as deficits, as this is how our medical criteria is defined. However, it should be noted that the neurodiversity movement, which asserts that human variation is natural, valuable, and should be celebrated, suggests that these differences in presentation may best be described as just that, differences, rather than deficits or challenges. I often defer to the family's preference when speaking about the diagnostic criteria, but do think it important to note that as professionals in the field, assessing for autism is considering how the following symptoms interfere or get in the way of an individual's ability to engage in their day-to-day -day activities. This is true of any diagnosis in the DSM-5, that the symptoms of any qualifying diagnosis must together cause clinical impairment. So, within the category of social communication deficits, we are looking for three different examples of challenge. The first of the three required criteria is deficits in social-emotional reciprocity. This can include things like atypical approach to social interaction, reduced sharing of interests, emotions, or affect, difficulty sustaining reciprocal or back and forth conversation, or difficulties initiating or responding to social interactions. This would be considered in relation to the individual's expressive language and developmental level, meaning it extends to nonverbal communication efforts as well. The second criteria in this section is deficits in nonverbal communicative behaviors that are used for social interaction. This does not just mean differences with eye contact, though that is commonly identified as a classic difference for autistic people. It is true that many individuals with autism have reduced eye contact and reduced nonverbal communication skills, such as emotional facial expression and gesture use. However, Differences here also include poorly integrated verbal and nonverbal communication. For example, right now I'm speaking, I'm making eye contact to a camera, but go with me here. I'm gesturing, my tone of voice is changing, and my facial expression is changing, and this is all happening fluidly to supplement my verbal message. In autism, the integration of these skills tends to look different. Nonverbal communication skills may appear more stilted or rehearsed, and often these skills lack natural integration with one another. Autistic individuals may also miss these nonverbal social cues in those around them, causing them to misinterpret others' communication or to miss out on the social information provided by recognizing these cues in other people or environments. The third and final criteria in this category is deficits in developing, maintaining, and understanding relationships. This can include things like difficulties adjusting behavior to suit various social contexts, difficulties in engaging and sharing imaginative play, challenges making friends or reduced interest in peers, though I would note that that last descriptor is often cited as a gross overgeneralization. Many, many individuals with autism are socially motivated, but may have difficulty knowing how to initiate friendships, or more commonly, how to sustain friendships once they're established. As mentioned previously, all three of these criteria need to be met within the category of social communication deficits. The second category where we assess for differences is related to restricted repetitive patterns of behavior, interests, or activities. This category includes four different criterion, though only two of the four listed are required to be sufficient for a diagnosis of autism. Perhaps the most widely recognized symptom in this category is stereotyped or repetitive motor movements, use of objects, or speech. For example, this would include simple motor stereotypies like hand flapping, lining up toys, or flipping objects, engaging in direct echolalia or immediate echoing of other speech, or the use of idiosyncratic or atypical phrases. Then we have behavioral rigidity, such as insistence on sameness, inflexible adherence to routines, or ritualized patterns of verbal or nonverbal behavior. 
For example, extreme distress at small changes, difficulties with transitions, rigid thinking patterns, specific greeting rituals, or needing to take the same routes or eat the same food every day. These are often the kids who need their morning or evening routine to go in a very specific way and may have significant behavioral meltdowns if their typical routine is disrupted or changed. Another well-known symptom is that of highly restricted or fixated interests that are unique in intensity or focus. For instance, strong attachment to or preoccupation with unusual objects, excessively circumscribed or perseverative interests. Notably, though it can be that an individual's interest area is unusual or esoteric in nature, like traffic patterns or electrical sockets or medieval history, often these interest areas are not atypical, but intense in their preoccupation or depth of knowledge. For instance, many four-year-old boys like dinosaurs, but fewer of them need to carry two specific dinosaur toys, one in each hand, wherever they go, and even fewer can recite dinosaur names, specifics about their diet, and unique aspects of the crustaceous period in which they lived. Hyper or hypo reactivity to sensory input or unusual interest in sensory aspects of the environment is the final criterion in the second category. This can include things like apparent indifference to pain or temperature, adverse response to specific sounds or textures, like covering their ears when the coffee grinder goes on, excessive smelling or touching of objects, or visual fascination with lights or movement, like watching things spin or spinning objects, dropping objects and watching them fall, or tapping objects to hear the difference in the sound. Many autistic children may have limited variation in their diet or in the clothes they will tolerate wearing, for instance, because of difficulties tolerating sensory differences across foods and fabrics. If, following clinical assessment, all three of the first category and at least two of the second category of criteria are met, a diagnosis of autism may likely be indicated. The final considerations include ensuring that these symptoms have been present since early in development and that the presence of these symptoms are creating obstacles or causing impairment within the individual's life. These are important factors in autism diagnosis, as in some presentations of autism, the differences in behavior or deficits in skill may not reveal themselves until later in development. The research is increasingly showing evidence of this related to girls with autism who tend to have stronger social skills than boys and consequently may not socially fall behind their non-autistic peers until later in childhood or adolescence. I hope this short video was a helpful refresher for those of you who are actively involved in screening or diagnosing autism in your practice. And also for those of you who may have just been curious to learn a little bit more about the diagnostic criteria for autism. For more information about our autism education programs and physician training initiatives, please reach out to the Children's Hospital Physician Relations Team. Thanks for watching and take good care.